So, but growing up, I was the guy that was buying PA. So I'm learning all about frequency sounds and crossover points and, you know, buying mixing consoles and all this stuff. So I started to really understand frequencies and, you know, total harmonic distortion and all these sort of feedback you know, loops. and all that <clears throat> Yeah. Shit. These yeah. sort of audio file kind of, you know, thinking. And so for me, clean low end was, was always very important. In fact, I remember setting up, plugging into my PA, just going, this sounds awesome. You know, it was this, this wall of sound, but the problem with really super clean <clears throat> bass like that, when you're sort of bi amping and triumphing it is then as soon as the guitars and the drums and the other musicians walk in the room, your bass just vanishes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, in fact, I was talking to Mike Brignardello uh, up in Nashville. I think when we were cutting uh, cryptic writings, cause he was in giant with Dan Huff. And we were talking about that. And he, he mentioned that too. He goes, he goes, I find, because I was asking him what he cuts records in Nashville with. And he said, <clears throat> you know, mostly Fenders and the Sadowskis a yeah. little bit. And uh, some of the fan fret stuff was starting to, to come out at that point. But um, he, he said, he goes, you know, I, I find that when I play with active electronics, when I record with it, he goes, it sounds good when I record it. But then as the, the track starts to come together with all the other instruments, the bass just vanishes. It gets very transparent. I was like, God, that is a perfect description of exactly yeah. the challenges that I had had, you know, that you get this really nice bass on. In fact, after a while I started, I do today too, I cut bass after all the other instruments are done. I'll cut, I'll cut bass last. <clears throat> In fact, I just it. did it on a song right before I came out here. Um, a song that we're you know working on with my solo band and and it's it's got drums, guitars, vocals, it's got everything on it, and I put bass on it last because now I know where my room is and how yeah. big I can get the bass to sound. So oh. I actually like that better. And I've if, never heard of somebody doing that. Though. It's ever. awesome. Well, there's two ways. That's how I prefer to do it. <clears throat> when we did the Megadeth Dystopia record, I played first to a click. I didn't even know the songs. I just basically had Dave show them to me as we put it down. And then I basically just played bass to a click. And um, there was some demos of Chris Adler on drums and Dave and Kiko kind of playing some stuff in the background. But I didn't reference any of it because I didn't. I just came in, learned the songs and, and literally just played them to a click, which I think <clears throat> spoke well to our musical relationship at that time, but also to how important you know, my bass performances are to that band, you know, and we're yeah. to, oh, we're to yeah. that, 100%. To that sound of that band, you know. Well, <clears throat> a singer's voice, I'm going to tell you something. It follows the bass more. A lot of people don't realize that, <clears throat> especially in a full band atmosphere, because that bass is cutting and it is clean and it is. So for me personally, anyway, like mm -hmm. I have to, I like to lock in with the bass tone. For, for a vocal. That's interesting. And maybe too, because it also is the note, right? It's yeah. the root. The root it defines note. the right. Absolutely. <clears throat> right. Absolutely. But uh you take that out of the mix and you're you're trying to sing to two distorted guitars. It's 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 Yeah, I've noticed that in different. rehearsals with you. It's yep. like if yep. Mark's bass isn't loud enough for you, you're like yep. hey man, it I, he's kinda like my pitch pipe. I need yep. him. Yep. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. The bass is the found, like the girth, the foundation. Yeah. Uh, excuse me, it'd be the drums, but go ahead. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, and then the guitar is color, you know, and all right. that stuff. So it's, I, I totally understand what you're saying. Yeah. Well, it, I think working with Dan Huff, he talked about that having this frequency map, and maybe it was his engineer Jeff Balding talked about that. They sort of had this frequency map, and it was surprising how. You know, I mean, everybody in Nashville, if you're if you're on the session, you can obviously play, you can mix, you're, mm -hmm. you know, you're not, like we talked about earlier, there's only a handful of people that make all the records and there's a reason they're, yeah. they're extremely, you know, gifted, uh, you know, participants. And it's funny with, um, you know, how, you know, Nashville's a very clean town as yeah. well, right? The, the sound that comes out of there is, is very clean. It's very polished. I like that a lot. In fact, that Cryptic Writings record that we did, I think that's got probably some of my favorite bass tone of any of the Megadeth records. The separation on everything. <clears> yeah. You know, it's there. funny. There was, um, you know, we we rehearsed at Soundcheck up there, which yeah. now is center staging maybe. Yeah, mm -hmm. center stage. Soundcheck. <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> Peavy had an office there, like an artist relations office. So they had some big A10 cabinets. We wheeled them in. I was like, you know, I turned them to two, you know, the vamp. I'm like, yeah. every Dave and Marty are yelling at me to turn down. I thought, I finally found my amp, you know? Yeah. It's <laughs> like a two. It, and yeah. If you can be louder, if you can piss the guitar players off and they make you turn down, <laughs> this is an awesome bass amp, you know? Yeah. Because it's a struggle in a metal band or any big loud group, you know, to get 
you know, the, uh, those low end frequencies to, to come through. So, um, so that was, that was, and so what we did is we took one amp, we took everything over a hundred Hertz and rolled it off. I think it was like a 15 inch, uh, cabinet with a PV head on it. Right. Then we had another one, kind of an SVT. There's like an 810 cabinet of theirs that was a full range. And then I played through one of Marty's crate, 100 watt guitar amps with some, you know, a little bit of grunge and distortion, distortion on yeah. it. And that's though, and then plus a DI. So we had, you know, all these different options for mixing. And it really got this nice low end. And then uh, they had there too one of those DBX, uh, like an Octaver, right? That would go the octave lower. And those things are tricky because they don't track very well. And you can't play very fast with them because they have to catch up to what you're playing. You know what I mean? They get a little warbly down there. But they found that one really worked well. And that's why, like on Trust, for instance, the opening track, it had this nice warm when the band came in. I did this kind of U2 chord thing in the yeah. beginning, you know. And then once the band kicked in, in fact, the mixing, you talk about the mixing, the mixing was so great. It sounded like pyro was going off. Like, good, 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 good. Right. <laughs> it's like Kiss. Like every Kiss song is like written for pyro, you know? Like <laughs> Rock City, right? Like, <laughs> 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 